Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here's today's host, Monica Profit. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the New Trust Economy. I am Monica Profit and I'm here with Debbie Bloyd, the owner of DOB Mortgage Services. Debbie, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So let me just get this straight first of all, because I'm based in New York City and a lot of times I have these really crazy time change differences and sometimes it seems reasonable. And so, I mean, I know I'm not talking to you from Singapore, but where exactly is, are you and DOB Mortgage Services based? Oh, we are based out of Dallas, Texas, so I cover the entire state. So I've got a, an office in College Station and where I've been for 30 years, and I've got an office up in Dallas where I've been for the last year. And so I get to travel all over the great big state of Texas. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, I'm actually from Texas originally, and all my family is from Texas, so I bet you if we dug into How did you get to New York? We're going to be related. I'm based in New York now, but I'm the weird one. Like all of my family on both sides. We're so, we're so from Texas. I'm probably related to myself. I mean, that is how <laughs> deeply from Texas all the way back we go. Good or bad for that one. But um, yeah, I, I ended up, my, both of my parents were the weirdos that left Texas for Colorado, raised their kids in Colorado and went on their own ways eventually. I ended up even further north in Washington and then finally out here in New York. So I am just the, the black sheep of the black sheep. Wow. Black yeah, sheep. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but I do. I go back to Texas about once a year to see all my extended family and I just love it. So it's nice to talk to a fellow Texan. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I see your background. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. I just love that quote from Pablo. I, I finally decided, you know, we talked a little bit before we started this interview on on uh, being, I do so many different things. So I do, I've done mortgages for 25 years. I've got an insurance license. I've done property and casualty and life and health um, for about the last 12. Um, I do uh, securities and investing for families. And I do just a lot of counseling for money. And so what I've decided is I am just a money helper. Whatever, <laughs> whatever you need, I can either hook you up with or get you to somebody that can help you. So are you an RIA? Is that it? The registered uh, independent? What is it? I am. Oh I am. And, and I'm also a CSA, which is a certified senior advisor. I do a lot of reverse mortgages and that makes them and their families more comfortable knowing that I know how to talk to seniors. I know what they're going through. Um, so we've been trained kind of how to do that. And then with um, the mortgage business, you know, we have to have so many licenses. And I'm, I became a broker. Again, I was a broker up until about 2008 went to work for big companies for a while, became vice president of a couple banks. And now I'm back being a broker because I can just, I, I can offer so many extra products that being at a bank can't. Banks are very in the box and you can't touch the edges. And um, there are so many loan products out there that needs to help people that they just think is unfathomable. And like, who would ever do that? Well, customers need that. And I work with a lot of self-employed people. They need lots of options. Absolutely. I mean, as a self-employed person myself, it is, it is a, always a challenge when I think about a refi or what I'm going to do about something, how I'm going to make it happen, because on, on paper is a different you know, por portion of- You need a bank statement loan. So as a bank statement loan, you would only use your last 12 months or 24 months of the deposits. We don't count the expenses. So you don't have to give us tax returns, but you're going to pay a little bit higher rate, about a point higher for not providing tax returns. But that's oh, the way all self-employed people do it. Yeah. And do you just cover Texas or do you cover other states nearby? I'm licensed in Texas and Florida, but I've been licensed in Arizona, California. So wherever anybody needs a loan, it's really easy. Not, I wouldn't say easy, but it's, it's not as hard as you would think to get a license in another state once you've been licensed in one state. Oh, I bet. So you just yeah. have to take their state licenses. You're, about 2008, we all had to go be licensed all of a sudden, and they were in background checks. And so a lot of people that could not make it out here as a broker became a banker. And that way, Wells Fargo or Bank of America, whoever you worked for, 
took on the financial responsibilities and the errors and omissions of anything you would do wrong so you wouldn't go to jail. As a broker, I have to do all that for myself and make sure I don't go to jail and don't do anything wrong. And um, yeah, so it's a different licensing now. Now that we're licensed nationally, it's really easy to get licensed in the individual states you need. So if you need a loan, yes, I'll get licensed in New York. I can help. <laughs> that is great. That is so good to know. It's funny because that you mentioned so many banks in Texas. It turns out um, one of my cousins, and I always say each cousin is my favorite cousin, don't tell the other ones, <laughs> but my favorite cousin, Terry, uh, Brotherton is on the board of the Texas Citizens Bank down in uh, Houston. So I Got feel it. like I've, I've already heard so much about Texas banks just from the things that he talks about, you know. Oh, like, sure. In this sure. Like, Southern drawl, it's just lovely to hear him talk about all the different things that happen at the bank, you know, that deep Southern. And, you know, banks are usually set up to do more commercial banking than personal banking. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the case with a lot of banks, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, so we've been talking a bit before we started this, um, this um, interview about some of the mortgage stuff that you do, but also the way that COVID and the whole, you know, staying in place and sheltering where you are and all of that, this desire to keep our social distancing, not even a desire, because I got to say it's driving me absolutely crazy. I didn't right. realize how much I needed people in my life until this happened. But now that's really affecting the processes that happen with, with just, you know, not just mortgages, but, you know, buying and selling a real estate. And that's kind of my passion too. I'm securitizing real estate with my business. And so I've always been looking at this from a really abstract view, but now to see that you guys that are, you know, in the, in the midst of processing loans and showing, you know, props, how are some of the, what are the major changes that you've noticed in just this short? Well, you know, when we first started and this just first started, you know, a couple months ago, um, lenders were fine. Everybody was fine. Business was usual until about two weeks ago. And then as we got the stay in place, um, a couple of the bigger lenders quit letting us lock our loans so far in advance. So when someone typically buys a house, they want to lock their loan and then we have to close within 30 days. What's happening now is they won't let us lock the loan until they're out of underwriting and they've had their appraisal and they're ready to close. Then we can lock their loans at a couple of big lenders. So I'm just not using those lenders right now. Nobody wants that uncertainty. Everybody wants to find a house, lock right away. So I've had to move to other lenders because some of the big ones needed to free up their credit lines. So what was happening is they have so many people with locked loans. You know that that loan is locked. They're going to close. You've got to reserve that money. The lines of credit were just too big for some of these companies to keep. So if they don't allow us to lock until the end, they don't need that big a credit line until the end. So it, it frees up their credit. Other companies, smaller companies are fine. So we're just having to, you know, as a broker, I'm signed up with different lenders for that reason. There's some that do bank statement loans, some do faster underwriting. Right now we have a, a couple banks that I'm using that are doing refinances. They're slow. They're going to be 45 days to, to close a refinance, but the rates are spectacular. Right. So I'm, if you've already owned your home and you call me for a refinance, I'm going to put you with that company. That way you get the best rate and you don't care when you close. Um, it's hard on some of my uh, real estate broker friends um, that they refer business to me to um, look at property right now. Nobody wants to go in the homes. Everybody wants to look at a virtual tour. So we've seen a lot of social media showing homes and do virtual tours. Um, the, big, the big tagline is you can find your spouse online. You can find your next house online. <laughs> Of course, you know, you got to date a couple times probably after that virtual meeting uh, and, and everybody wants to walk through their house. So I think a lot of people have a little go list of like five or six homes they want to see once things free up and we can travel around freely again. Yeah. But until then, everybody's holding what they have. Now, I have a lot of closings on the board of houses and people that already had contracts in place before this happened. So we're just working through the pipeline, uh, but no new stuff. So after about May 1st is my last purchase. Everything else is refinances. Right. So refinances are really the only thing that can be, can be easily executed because there's no need to see stuff, right. go through all that process. And, and we've got title companies right now in Texas on, the, on a pretty day. They've got their tables outside and people are signing um, outside the title companies. It's like a big picnic. Um, and then they've got a lot of mobile notaries, but those mobile notaries don't want to go in homes either. So they're standing people outside. They're signing on their cars. We've gotten very creative with where we're going to sign our paperwork. Um, in the state of Texas, especially, I don't know every other state, but we, um, we don't let you have a notary if you do a cash out. So those people are still happy to go to the title companies. 
I went to my last closing a couple weeks ago. Now I just join it over the phone. If they have any questions, I'm there. I just keep my phone, you know, on my desk going and, and they, I, I get to hear the closing because um, I don't get to go. They don't allow anybody extra in right now. Yeah, it makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, you were saying that there was a lot of e-signing of documents too. I mean, that's something that I, I feel very comfortable with. But then again, I've worked in technology for 15 years. So e-signing. Right. Oh, and, and the banks and insurance are so far behind. I did a paper app the other day for a uh, life insurance company and they make you print out all the pages. It's not even e-signable or DocuSign. So the real estate agents can still DocuSign documents. We can DocuSign a few things but not everything. So there's still a few documents in the loan process that has to have a wet signature and then we scan them back in. Um, the financial planning companies, a lot of the big companies still use fax machines oh to trade, God. to do trades and exchanges. You've got to fax it into a number. And of course I have an e-fax. Nobody has a fax machine anymore, I know. Um, but these companies, yeah. So it's oh. still out there. It's not all technology savvy. Yeah, it's funny. I actually use the fax machine um... Uh, analogy pretty often when I talk about the way that the internet has kind of evolved because the first wave of the internet was the internet of communication, right? So people were, you're going to be able, the big deal was, you know, what, someday you're going to be able to send a message to someone across the world in China for free. And it's like, well, you're never going to use stamps again. You're never going to use a fax machine. You're never going to use FedEx or UPS, but you're just going to put all the mail carriers out of business. And it's like, well, no, mail carriers still have their place, but fax machines have kind of been put out of business for the most part. Like you don't use them too often anymore. No, I use, but I, I get several security stuff in with e-fax. So there are still people that, that want a fax signature. I remember when faxes first came out and I was in a bank and they were like, we, we can't accept these signatures. We don't know who's on the other end. Oh my God. Like, you gotta be kidding. And they're oh like, but God. you can't see them actually sign the papers. So the banking industry is way far behind. I'm just yeah. sorry that, yeah, they're not very technological. They're, yeah. they're a bunch of older, older um, individuals that run the banks and uh, some of these small community banks still sit around once a week and vote on loans. And I think Texas Citizens Bank still does. I think there's still weekly loan. Raise your hand if you want Bob to have his auto loan or loan for cows or whatever. And they do that. So yeah, it's still around. It is still around. Yeah, you know, we're, with the new trust economy, we named it this way because with the second wave of the internet, we realized that the big deal, here it comes, is not gonna be that you can send a message to someone in Kenya but you can transact with someone in Kenya for free. And everyone, of course, is saying, oh my gosh, if you can do that, well, what, are you gonna put, put banks out of business? Are you gonna get rid of all commercial lenders? Are you gonna get rid of every, every you know, financial tool? And it's like, well, no, but we are gonna be able to just transact and send money with your phone instantly, just like an email. And in, in the same way, like the fax machine equivalent is probably something like Western Union. And, and now with title companies, you know, they went to the, everybody had a cashier's check. And then, well, you know, the, the great crown prince came in and took everybody's money on the internet. And, and now, so title companies went to wires. That was so much easier. But now there's so much wire fraud out there. We're back, yeah. to, we're back to, you know, a regular cashier's checks again. It, it kind of comes and goes. Technology is not our friend in our business. Technology sort of takes a step forward, another a couple steps forward and one back, you know, back and forth. So I realize you are not only um, in, you kind of do so many things, right? You're, you're an RIA and a CSA. What exactly does that mean? And what does it mean for being though, that kind of, those kind of certified, you know, having those certifications and talking to people about things like refining or, you know, addressing their money situation? Well, you know, just for an example, I, I did a TV interview here in Dallas on one of the morning shows. And by the time I got done talking, I had several clients, um, people that had called in the station and wanted to know my number. And their biggest question was, I don't know what you can do to help us. You sound very knowledgeable. We don't know where to start. And so a lot of people, that's, that's probably how I've gotten to this, to be morphed into this over the years. Is just, you know, I, I was married to a gentleman that had an insurance company. We had it together. Um, when I got divorced, I kept my license and I just moved my business to another company. Um, but to be in his office, I had to bring, I had to have a license. Now my kids are going into insurance as well because they think dad works a lot less than mom and a lot of residual income where mortgages, I have to recreate that income stream every month. Um, but I, but I do have a lot of clients from that. And what I never understood was a lot of people just want one part of the equation. But what happens is you go to your, your bank and they tell you one thing. 
You go to your attorney, he tells you something else. You go to a financial planner and you know, like your CPA is gonna write everything off, but then you can't buy a house. And wouldn't it be nice if somebody knew all that stuff up front? Well, there's very few of us little people running around that know a little bit about all of those things. So, you know, a lot of times I have to get my CPA for my client in the same room with a financial advisor in the same room with me to explain to them how all this works. Because um, you get a divorce, the attorney bangs the gavel, you're divorced, but they haven't dissolved all your assets properly. So nobody knows how to take, a, take that 401k money and convert it into anything. Nobody understands if they have to leave it there or turn it into an IRA. They don't understand if there's any penalties. They award somebody a house and a divorce, whether it's the husband or the wife, and they can't qualify to refinance it. So those people are attached still financially, even though he's moved out of the house, what happens? He goes and finds a new wife, they want a new house. Now he's on the old house and he can't afford the new house because she can't afford to refinance because she doesn't qualify. And this could have all been handled if they'd have just talked to one person that could have guided them through this. And then everybody's mad. And so um, it's just a lot of, you need a lot of trusted advisors to all talk. And so after I've been, you know, hired with different attorneys and and gone through a divorce myself, you know, you, you kind of understand how it all fits together. The problem is I love to talk money and finances. My daughter is like, mom, you just work too much. And I'm like, I love what I do. It's not work. Um, but you know, if, if you were to come to me, you do what you do. You don't love what I love. So you must not, I mean, I have people that come to me and say, you know, I really don't even know how to set a budget. And I'm wondering, how did you even exist without knowing how to set a budget? How do you walk and chew gum then? Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. Like, what's wrong with you? But, you know, they are a tech person or they're um, a, an accountant or they're something else. They're not me. And so there's a lot of people that go through life that are physicians and doctors and dentists and school teachers that do not focus their whole 12 hour days on money and finances. And they don't even want to talk about it is the problem. So they come to me and they're like, well, just fix it. And I'm like, do you know what's wrong? No, but no, it's not working. I don't want to know what's wrong. I just want you to fix it. Here's all things. Please make this divorce e easy. Please make my refinance easy. That right. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, I used to say I had little toddlers and I have to make everything really simple. And now I say I have college kids and I have to make things really simple. You know, you, I have to talk non-money talk to people. So I think that's probably one of my traits is that, you know, I don't, um, as being a uh, vice president of a bank, they always wanted me to be in a suit and sit on my side of the desk and act like I was smarter than everybody. And, and the same thing with the financial planning world, they, they fill your head with so much gobbledygook that you don't understand. You're just, you just sign just to shut them up and you hope that they under, cause you don't get it. I want my clients to get it. So it, I can boil it down to pretty easy situations that they can understand. You know, long-term care isn't complicated. You're going to get old. You're going to need help. You need an insurance policy to pay for most of that. Let me show you how that works for your age. Right. Um, it's simple, simple premises. It's just ideal and stuff that people don't want to do. They don't want to talk about getting old. They don't want to talk about their investments. They don't want to talk about losing their money in their stock market. Um, they don't like certain things that they view complicated. So those are all the things that will save you in the end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really, you're just sort of a parachute maker for people. Like, I, I am. And, and I make them do all the stuff they don't want to do. I'm just no, like a... Specifically, just so people know, what is an RIA versus a CSA? So a CSA is a certified senior advisor. Um, anyone can be a CSA in the healthcare business dealing with older adults. So you can have attorneys be CSAs, healthcare providers be CSAs, um, home health companies make their people be CSAs. It helps us learn to deal with seniors with all of the things that they are, are up against. Uh, dementia, not letting their family know about their finances, how they are scared to confide in people, how we have to help them and explain things to them without freaking them out. Um, and, and how to talk to the families. Because you know, a lot of seniors, as they get older, they don't wanna tell anyone the good and the bad. They don't wanna tell people they have lots of money because they're afraid someone's gonna take it. They don't wanna provide for some of the things that they're going to have to provide for because like one lady, she told me, she goes, I don't want to hear one more thing about long-term care. I am going to die healthy. 
Oh. Yeah, yeah, but you're not. But one you're out of ten will maybe be healthy enough to live. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one out of ten will maybe fall asleep and never wake up. But that's not the case. You have a stroke. You have a heart attack. You have dementia, and then you need money to help take care of you. Um, so um, yeah, it's those kind of things. Surprised that I was the executor of my father's will. I was 39 years old. Got a call. My dad was traveling overseas in Ecuador. Oh, your father's died. I had oh, no. to Ecuador. I know, and it turns out I can tell you this. I know just enough Spanish to get you cremated. So, <laughs> oh my god, got him cremated. Brought him, brought his remains back. Brought his, his, you know, all of his luggage back with my luggage. That's more luggage than you're supposed to have. Why do you have right. that? I got searched at the border for it. Whose luggage is this? Did you pack this bag? No, actually, I didn't. But the guy in the box did. Yeah. You know, I have an answer. The guy in the urn did. Yeah. And finding out now, where would he have hidden a will? Let me just think. And See, and parents don't like to talk about I that. I mean, I finally find the will. And then, to my surprise, I find out I'm the executor of it. Didn't know that. I mean, So you guys never talked about this before? Never. Never. And so he unexpectedly passes away, and suddenly there's no time to even grieve because I'm busy doing all the... I have to have probate. You know what I mean? It was ridiculous. So I definitely had a crash course in... I think it really boils down to this. We live in such an individualistic society. We hail the individual, you know, uh, do well for yourself, but maybe don't brag about it. If you do show what you're doing, don't show too much. All these things that really make you a self-contained little unit and oh, maybe you and your partner and that's it. Other than that, you know, we're not even supposed to say, hey, I need you to your neighbors, to your family, to your friends, to right? Or to your executor. And because of that, you know, we just get to live in this delusion that we're going to always be self-reliant when really, I think some of the more tender moments of living themselves it, itself is like wrapped up in when you are interdependent and you admit it and you, and you get to feel caught and, and held and cradled by other people, you know? We've and people are learning that. I, one of the problems is that people think they're never going to die. And, and in my business, I've always had told my staff, you know, every file needs to be set up the same. Everything has to look the same because if I die and I get hit by a truck today, they still want to close on time and they still want the interest rate. I promised them. They're going to go, gosh, that's really sad. We like Debbie, but, but you know, did I get my 3.25 interest rate for a 30 year fix? You know, that's what they want to know. And so, um, I've always looked at things differently. Um, and, and I, that's a blessing and a curse. Um, so I talk about all those hard to say things that their families can't talk to with them. I am brought in to do phone conversations and meet them in person. And, and let's just talk about planning your life. Some of my friends, I mean, my, both my parents are deceased already, but most of my friends, they're still going through their family being older and dementia and you know, mom is getting old and persnickety and she's keeping all the secrets and we don't know what we're going to do. We got to take care of her. We have so many people quitting their jobs to become caretakers. They're losing out on income for them. They're losing out on their investments for their 401ks where they could easily um, better pay for a provider to do that so they could keep working. Right. And people go, Debbie, it's just not about money. Yeah, it's not until it is. It's and then you don't have enough when you get old. I mean, without money, it's not about, you, you need enough money to be able to keep just doing the things you want to do. And it's, it's exactly, it's not about money until it suddenly is. And you don't want it to ever be about money. So why don't you get ahead of it and let somebody else handle that? Well, you know, just because you have money saved up doesn't mean you need to flaunt it or buy a Ferrari or whatever. Um, and so some of my friends are pleasantly surprised that their parents have money, yet they've been living like paupers forever. Um, and then some of my friends, you know, they get called on like I did to say, well, I can't afford my health insurance. You're going to need to pay. All the kids are going to have to chip in. Well, that's usually about the age where you have kids going to college. Yeah. You've got to take care of your parents. Um, and then you quit putting money aside for your retirement. So you're jeopardizing your future by taking care of everybody else. Exactly. You can get a loan for your kids to go to college. You cannot get a loan for retirement. And a lot of my clients forget that. Yeah, that is true. That's a really good point, actually. You know, what you can get a loan for and what you got to really just plan on the equity side for. I mean, like, you just got to put in the money. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so so being, uh, being a little bit of everything has helped me and my clients. It, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not an attorney and I'm not an accountant, but I know them yeah. and I can get you in touch with them yeah. um, so that they can help you out. So, you know, I, I think what's happening is everyone's so diversified. They only know their lane. But it's, yeah. it's really nice to come to someone like me that knows more lanes that can say, okay, you write everything off your taxes, great for you and Uncle Sam, but now you can't buy a house or now you can't refinance your house or now you can't qualify for the million dollar house you want because you don't show any income. 
Right. You know, your CPA has done a great job of now you can't, you can't do anything. And now you so, can't do anything. <laughs> so yeah. Good, good luck. Sam. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So you, you either pay it to uncle Sam or you pay a higher interest rate yeah. or you, do, you get to rent. You pay it somewhere, you know? Yeah, you end up exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, gosh, I feel like you've got such a plethora of information and I'm going to make sure that all of the links to what you're up to and what you can do for people are going to be in our show notes. But, oh, thanks. Um, just, this has been such a great conversation. I'm so glad to learn about this. And also just that in the middle of the country where I, you know, you're, you're going over the entire great state of Texas and people are, you know, they're not used to this like remote stuff and like the distancing thing. And, you know, as much as the internet's been around forever, has it really been used as much as it could be to make people's lives simpler in some of these industries? The answer is clearly just no, you know? No. And, and you know, they say that, you know, out of, by the intonation of your voice and by what you look like and you're always sized up and, and people can tell by, you know, your tone and, and everything. Um, visual is, is a lot too, because people can like pick up on signs and tells. Um, but I really think it's just as easy to talk like this with you and me. I would, I would, I would have you over for coffee. I'd go out to drink with you. You're tons of fun. Um, and, and we didn't have to meet in person to do this. So I think what's going to happen is whether we stay like this for six months or two months or one more week, I think people are going to change the way they do business. You know, conferences, my daughter um, and son are both in college. He goes to Ole Miss and she goes to TCU. And um, yeah, it's so nice. And he was on a, a team call with his Zoom buddies for like nine of them. And she gets her eight uh, girls on Zoom calls. They can watch Netflix movies together. They oh, can do yeah. all kinds of stuff. And, and they can't wait to be together until in May when they move in together. Um, social distancing or not, at least they'll be in the same house. Yeah. But they got their lives cut short, you know, right after spring break. So their fraternities and sororities and finals and everything is now changed. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really sad for them. but it's a new way of doing school. And a lot of kids are having trouble. A lot of grownups are having trouble with the distancing, but I think we're going to see more of this. Um, and we're probably going to appreciate our friendships a little bit more when you can hug again. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I realized, you know, I, I always thought I was kind of a, a solo introverted person. I work from home usually, you know, so I'm all, I'm, it's not a big difference for me, but I realized no, but as soon as my workday was done, I was leaving the house to go see my friends who worked in restaurants or to see, meet my friends in a restaurant or right. go on a long walk or get coffee somewhere, go to a movie, see a Broadway show even, like all these things I can do in New York City. That's why I live here. Right. My after time, it wasn't that I was commuting to work and that was going to break my heart if I didn't do it. Believe me, I am happy to not have to commute to work. It adds two extra hours to my day that's not taken up commuting. But, oh my gosh, like the evenings have been bizarre, you know? Cause I'm like, okay. Just so brutal. It's just the same. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's the same as the day. I've never worked harder while everybody else is, is at home or they may be have furloughed or lost their jobs. I have never worked harder, yeah. uh, but I'm so appreciative for the business and, and knowing that I can help people lower their bills right now. It's yeah, a big deal. Absolutely. Well, gosh, it has just been a pleasure talking with you. And you are definitely one of the hardest working women I have interviewed on this podcast yet. Oh, I that's really great. Appreciate it. And I'm sure anybody who's looking for a refi, guys, you heard me right here. You're going to find <laughs> that woman. And um, we'll make sure that we just include all the information about all of your projects and stuff in our show notes. So. Great. Well, you and I are going to stay in touch because I'd like to do this again. Oh my gosh. I would love it. Absolutely. And I feel like we should have virtual drinks sometime. You know, Mark I think so. Yes. I think you know? people are doing that all across America. So we can do that too. I know. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Debbie Bloyd, the owner of Diet Coconut. Mortgage Services. Yeah. Thank you cheers. so much. Thank you. There so you go. Much. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> all right. Well, this is going to wrap up this episode of the New Trust Economy and we'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks so much, you guys. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.